we're going to continue on with our discussion of software architecture. Um, and this presentation is going to talk about why is software architecture important. And we begin with this quote by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, where he says, to build, to build, that is the noblest art of all the arts. You know, he's really diving into, is we're talking about creation, we're creating something. And architecture is important for our creations to be successful. So we're going to dive into why architecture matters from a uh, technical perspective. Here we've got 13 reasons um, regarding, uh, you know, motivations for creating new architectures and ways in which uh, architecture is important for the analysis and evolution of an existing systems architecture. Uh, our first reason is that an architecture will inhibit or enable a system's driving quality attributes. We'll talk more about uh, quality attributes in future lectures, but we're talking about things like performance and security here. Number two is the decisions made in architecture allow you to reason about and manage change as a system evolves. And that's actually going to be one of the main themes throughout these software architecture lecture presentations is being able to handle future change because we know change is coming. Uh, number three is the analysis of an architecture enables early prediction of a system's qualities. Again, it kind of gets back to uh, number one, except here we're talking about the fact that you can analyze the architecture and you can predict ahead of time whether or not the system is going to meet your goals for security, performance, availability, and so on. Um, you know, num number one there is really saying, hey, it will be able, you know, quality attributes will be uh, enabled by the architecture. Number three says, you know, the architecture is giving you the ability to predict. Number four is a documented architecture enhances communication among the stakeholders. And this is perhaps my favorite reason of the 13 reasons. Um, you know, the fact that once you document the architecture, it allows everyone to be able to discuss it, uh, you know, which is pretty important. Number five is the architecture is a carrier of the earliest and hence most, most fundamental, hardest to change design decisions. Yeah, you know, if you think about it, you're laying the foundation for the building um, and that's hard to change later on. Number six is an architecture defines a set of constraints and subsequent implementation. And it's pretty similar to number five, except you know once you lay that foundation, um, all future builders are constrained by the decisions you made. Number seven, the architecture can dictate the structure of an organization or vice versa. You know, this makes a lot of sense. Um, if you decide that your architecture is going to be a three-tier system, then you might end up with a development team for each of those three tiers. Um, or the other way around, if your organization has three development teams, you might decide to create a three-tier architecture and give each development team some work to do. Um, Number eight, an architecture will provide the basis for evolutionary prototyping. Uh, um, number nine, an architecture is a key artifact that allows the architect and the project manager to have discussions about cost and schedule. Uh, number 10, kind of similar to number eight, an architecture can be created as a reusable model that forms the heart of multiple products that are based on that architecture. Number 11, architecture-based development focuses attention on the assembly of components rather than simply on their creation. Um, you know, architecture really focuses in on, you know, having things uh, built, uh, but also having uh, assembling pre-existing components. Um, number 12, by restricting design alternatives, architecture channels creativity of the developers, reducing design and system complexity. Yeah, so by uh, making some architectural decisions, you um, force the developers to just focus on really enhancing the system as opposed to, um, you know, making alternative designs, alternatives. Uh, number 13, an architecture can be the foundation for training a new team member, kind of similar to number four on the documented architecture enhancing communication with stakeholders. But actually, you know, your architecture docs might be the very first documents you show some new team member to get them up to speed and what the what the system is all about. All right, so that's 13 reasons why software architecture is important. We'll dive into each of these in a little more detail. Um, so the first one is inhibiting or enabling a system's quality attribute. A system's ability to meet its desired quality attributes is very often determined by the architecture. And that's a key uh, trend 
that we'll be talking about throughout these presentations. You know, if your system requires high performance, then you need to pay attention to things like managing the time-based behavior of elements, their use of shared resources, and the frequency and volume of communications. Um, if modifiability is important, then you need to pay attention to assigning responsibilities and limiting the interactions or a coupling of those elements so that the majority of changes in the system is only going to affect a small number of the elements. Ideally, each change would only affect a single element, and that would make your system very modifiable. From a security perspective, if your system must be highly secure, then you need to manage and protect uh, you know, the communication and control which element and which elements are allowed to access which information. You may need to uh, introduce specialized elements such as authorization mechanisms into the architecture to set up a perimeter against uh, intrusion. If you want your system to be safe and secure, you need to design in the safeguards and the recovery mechanisms. If you believe that scalability of performance is going to be important to your system, then you need to localize the use of resources to facilitate the introduction of higher capacity replacements. Um, and you want to avoid hard coding resource uh, assumptions or resource limits. If your project needs the ability to deliver incremental subsets of the system, you must manage uh, usage between components and so on. The strategies for quality attributes are uh, in many times cases determined by your architecture, but an architecture alone cannot guarantee the functionality or qualities required of a system. Poor downstream design by the developers or implementation decisions can always undermine a good architectural design. Um, so decisions at all stages of the life cycle from the architectural design stage to coding the implementation and testing will affect the overall system quality. Therefore, quality is not completely a function of architecture, but that's where it starts. So reasoning about managing change is one of the most important uh, aspects that some architects face. Um, and the ease with which change can be made, changes can be made to a system, which is our quality attribute of modifiability uh, that we'll talk about in a subsequent presentation. But change is such an important quality that it has its own spot in our list of 13 reasons why software architecture is important. The software development community is coming to the grip with the facts that roughly 80% of the typical software system's total cost occurs after initial deployment. You know, it's in the it's in the maintenance uh, and so forth that happens after where most of the money is spent. You know, most systems that people work on are in this phase where they've already been deployed. Many programmers and software development designers never get to work on a new, brand new system. Instead, they're working on uh, fixing and patching and upgrading existing systems that are being used by users. Uh, now, virtually all software systems change over their lifetimes to accommodate new features, to adapt to new platforms, to fix bugs, and so on. But the reality is these changes often have lots of difficulties. Every architecture, no matter what it is, <laughs> can uh, categorize potential changes into these three categories, a local change that can be accomplished by modifying a single component. For example, adding a new business rule to a pricing logic module, a non-local change, which requires multiple element changes, but leaves the underlying architectural approach intact. For example, adding a new business rule to a pricing logic module, then adding new fields to the database that this new business rule requires, and then revealing the results of applying the rule by upgrading the user interface to display the new information. Um, so that's three different changes to implement one change. Um, but an architectural change affects the fundamental ways in which the elements interact with each other and could potentially require changes all over the system. For example, changing a system from single threaded to multi threaded. Um, so obviously, local changes, since they only affect a single software element, are going to be the most desirable as they are going to be the fastest and cheapest to make. So an effective architecture is one in which most changes are going to be local and hence easy to make. Non-local changes are not as de desirable, but they do have the virtue that they can usually be rolled out in an orderly manner over time. You might make changes first to add a new pricing rule, then make the changes to actually deploy the new rule and so on. But deciding when changes are essential, determining which change paths have the least risk, assessing the consequences of proposed changes, 
and the priorities for changes and so forth all requires insight into relationships, performance, and behaviors of the software in the system. These tasks are all part of the description of the tasks that an architect has to make. Uh, you know, reasoning about the architecture and analyzing the architecture provide the insights necessary to make decisions about these changes. So let's talk about our next uh, reason, early prediction of system qualities. Um, architecture not only imbues systems with quality attribute, but it does so in a predictable way. Um, when designing an architecture will consist of making a series of uh, you know, design decisions, building the system, testing for quality attributes, and so on, um, you know, you don't want to just go through that process randomly. Instead, what you want to do is you want to make predictions about the system based on an evaluation of the architecture. If we know that certain kinds of architectural decisions lead to certain quality attributes in a system, then we can make those decisions and expect to receive uh, the associated quality attribute. For example, if we know that availability is important for our system, and if we design in uh, for example, redundant uh, database servers, then we know that should increase the availability of our system because if one database server fails, we have this second uh, database server that can still keep the system running. Um, now, there are multiple different ways in which you can model quality attributes, which we will talk about in a subsequent presentation. But basically, uh, the easier you can find a problem in your design, the cheaper, easier, and less disruptive, disruptive will be to fix it. And so that's one of the benefits of evaluating the architecture early on to determine whether or not we're actually going to be able to achieve the quality attributes that our stakeholders desire. So speaking about stakeholders, our fourth reason uh, is communication among the stakeholders and enhancing that communication. Architecture is an abstraction, and it's, use, it's a useful abstraction because it represents a simplified model of the whole system um, that you can keep in your head, you know, because you can't really have all the details of the system in your head, but you can keep a, an idea of the architecture in your head, or you can visualize it in diagrams and so on. And so architecture represents an abstraction of the system that most of the system of stakeholders can use as a basis for a mutual understanding of what the system can do, as well as negotiating uh, capabilities that they, we would like to have uh, in the system and forming consensus on you know, what capabilities were agreed to and communicating that, those uh, agreements with each other. So the architecture is sufficiently abstract that even non-technical people can usually understand the system to the extent that they need to. Um, and yet the abstraction can be refined into sufficiently rich technical specifications to guide implementation, integration, testing, and deployment. So each stakeholder of a software system, whether customers, users, project managers, coders, testers, and so on, are, have their own concerns uh, and have their own characteristics of the system that they are interested in. For example, a user might be concerned that the system is fast, reliable, and available. A customer who pays for the system might be concerned that the architecture is implemented on schedule and under budget. A manager uh, might be concerned that whether or not the architecture will allow teams to work independently. Um, the architect might be worried about strategies to achieve all the goals of all the stakeholders. And so architecture provides a common language in which different concerns can be expressed, negotiated, and resolved. Our next reason is earliest design decisions. Software architecture is you know, a manifestation of the early design decisions about the system. And these early decisions carry weight with respect to the system's remaining development time. Um, it is, you know, it's also the earliest point at which these important design decisions can be evaluated. Any design in any discipline can be viewed as a sequence of decisions. Uh, when painting a picture, an artist decides on the material for the canvas and whether the artist is gonna record uh, uh, images on a canvas using oil paint or watercolor or crayons or pencil, even before the picture is begun. Once the picture is begun, other decisions are immediately made. 
Where is the first line? What is going to be the thickness of that first line? What will be the shape of that first line? All of these early design decisions have an influence on the final appearance of the picture. And each design decision uh, constrains future decisions. Each decision in isolation might appear uh, small, but the early ones in particular have disproportionate weight simply because they influence and constrain all the subsequent decisions. And so it is with architecture. An architecture design can be viewed as a set of decisions. Changing those early decisions creates a ripple effect in terms of the additional decisions that must now be changed. Yes, sometimes architecture must be refactored or redesigned, um, but still, um, you know, these early design decisions uh, have a significant impact on the architecture. Some questions that might uh, be relevant to architecture are listed here. Questions like, will the system run on one processor or be across multiple processors? Will the software have layers? What sort of communication will the software components do? Synchronous, asynchronous, and so on. Will the system depend on features specific features from the operating system or the hardware? Will the information flow through the system be uh, encrypted? What communications protocol will we choose? And so on. And you know, once you've made those decisions and you've started uh, building your system based on some of those decisions, what if you have to go back and change those decisions? Um, that becomes a, a significant problem. And that leads to our next uh, reason for why architecture is important. Um, those early decisions uh, are essentially constraints on subsequent implementation. If you want your implementation to conform to an architecture, it must conform to the design decisions that are in that architecture. It must have the set of elements described by the architecture. Those software elements must interact with each other in the way that's described by the architecture. And each element must fulfill its responsibilities to the other elements. Uh, each of these is a, a constraint on the implementation team. You know, the builders of the software elements have to be fluent in the specifications of their elements, uh, and they need to, un but they don't necessarily need to know about the reasons why the architecture made that decision. They just need to know that this is what the architecture uh, constrains them to be doing. You know, the architect needs to know about the architectural trade-offs. You know, the architect um but then the architect just sort of hands off to the developers you know the lists of what the constraints are that they have to act within architecture can also influence the organizational structure you know not only does the architecture describe the structure of the system being developed but that structure be, can become engraved in the structure of the development project and even the or, entire organization. You know, the normal method for dividing up the labor of a large project is to assign different groups, different portions of the system to create, um, you know, sometimes referred to as a work breakdown structure. And, you know, because the architecture includes the broadest decomposition of the system, the architecture is often used as a basis for the work breakdown structure. You know, the work breakdown structure in turn uh, is going to have units of planning, scheduling and budget, inner team communication, uh, uh, file system organizations and so on. You know, teams often communicate with each other in terms uh, when they're working on the interface specifications for their elements because these el the teams need to cooperate on those. Um, the maintenance, maintenance activity, once the system is deployed, it should also reflect the software structure with teams formed to maintain specific elements from the architecture, the database, the business rules, the UI, the device drivers, and so on. You know, a side effect of establishing the work breakdown structure is to freeze some aspects of the software architecture. You know, a group that's responsible for one of the subsystems may resist having its responsibility distributed across other groups. You know, the database team may not want to have their team split up um, and instead they might want to maintain that database. So once the architecture has been agreed upon, it becomes very costly for management and business reasons to significantly modify it. Uh, this is one argument among many for analyzing the software architecture before set settling on a specific choice. Enabling evolutionary prototyping. 
Uh, our eighth reason why architecture is important is that once the architecture has been defined, it can be analyzed and prototyped as a skeletal system. So even though we haven't really deployed the system yet, we can analyze the architecture to determine how the architecture is, whether it's going to achieve uh, those quality attribute goals or not, based on what we can see of the architecture. And this approach aids the development process because the system, uh, you know, if we if we build a skeletal as part of the system, we'll actually be able to execute that skeletal part of the system, even though all the rest of the capabilities haven't been built in yet. Um, and hopefully this should reduce the potential risk in the project. Um, another advantage of software architecture is, again, with regards to incur increasing communication among the stakeholders, it can increase communication between the architect and the project manager when they are creating cost and schedule estimates uh, early in the project life cycle. You know, now, Costs and schedule estimates are an important tool. Um, and so the architect and the project manager should originally create these costs and schedule estimates based on what they believe the project is gonna require. Uh, now, while these top-down estimates are useful for setting goals and apportioning budgets, once a full project team is available, uh, bottom-up estimates from the entire team should be more effect efficient and more accurate than the top-down estimates created by the architect and the project managers. Another reason why architecture is important is that architecture can be used to create a transferable reusable model where we can use a sim where we can use the architecture to create multiple systems that are somewhat similar. Because not only can code, software code be reused, but so can the requirements that led to the architecture in the first place. So that's why we see many, many systems that are based on a three-tier architecture, because there are many uh, business problems that can be solved using that three-tier architecture. Um, and if an if a organization is building three-tier architecture systems, time after time after time, they'll gain a lot of experience uh, in building that type of architecture and they'll be very efficient at it. And in fact, if we look at software product lines or families of software products, they're often built using a very similar architecture uh, in this, uh, use, using this sort of transferable reusable model approach. Architecture also allows incorporation of independently developed components. You know, architecture-based development often focuses on components that are likely to have been developed separately or even independently from each other. And the architecture defines how you can bring those components into the system and have them work together to be successful. You know, today's modern systems often rely on commercial off-the-shelf components, open source software, publicly available apps, and custom built apps all working together, perhaps in the cloud or on premise or both to achieve the goals of the stakeholders. And the payoff for combining these components is decreased time to market, increased reliability because, you know, widely used software already has its bugs ironed out, lower cost and flexibility. Uh, another advantage of uh, why software architecture is important is to do with the fact that um, software architecture can restrict the vocabulary of design alternatives. In software, you can do almost anything. Uh, and unfortunately, having that tremendous flexibility can sometimes be a problem. And so by having an architecture that provides some voluntary constraints on what the developers can do, can sort of channel the developers to keep their decisions within a reasonable range of choices. And then the software developers should be able to move much faster because they're not distracted by the many, many alternatives that are possible. Uh, finally, uh, software architecture can be used as a basis for training. Uh, the architecture documentation can serve as the first introduction to the system for new project members. Um, the software architecture documents became an excellent source of training materials for training uh, developers as to what the system is supposed to do. So in summary, we took a look at 13 reasons why software architecture is important.
the first couple are going to be the main focus of these subsequent lectures on software architecture. But all these reasons are really important. The first one, of course, being that an architecture will inhibit or enable whether or not a system achieves the quality attributes that the stakeholders desire, whether or not the system's going to achieve your performance and security goals, for example. Number two, the decisions made in architecture will allow you to um, determine whether or not your system is going to be able to handle future requirements and change as necessary to, to achieve those future requirements. Number three is that the analysis of an architecture enables early predictions of a system's qualities. You know, again, not only does the architecture determine whether or not we can achieve the qualities, but we can actually predict before we've built the system whether or not we'll achieve those qualities, whether it's performance, security, availability, and so on. And then number four is the documented architecture enhances communication among the stakeholders. Um, and I'm not going to go through the rest of them, but the first four we're going to come back to over and over and over again. Um, the others we'll mention from time to time as well. All right, so thank you for tuning in to this brief lecture on why is software architecture important.